he is a true uh, pioneer and leader in the, the bike business, particularly uh, on the technology side. Really, uh, he and his uh, co-founding partner at Cervelo, uh, Gerard Vorman, uh, really invented what are the two main bikes that you see in all bike lines these days, the aerodynamic road bike and the all-around sort of grand tour bike. Every bike company has versions on those two and and Cervelo really put those two uh, styles of bikes on the map with cutting edge technology they developed back in the early 2000s. Uh, he is currently the interim president uh, for 4i, the power meter company uh, based in Calgary, Alberta. It is with great pleasure that we welcome Phil White uh, to uh, the symposium. Uh, over to you, Phil. Thanks very much, uh, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess uh, Steve and I go way back as well. Steve, uh, Steve and I, uh, Steve, I think was a year ahead of me actually in high school. And he was uh, one of the uh, top Canadian athletes on the cross country to national cross country team. I was just a wanker that uh, followed in his footsteps. But uh, anyways, good to see you again, Steve. Um, all right. So you guys, uh, I, what I hope to show you today is um, a bit of the history of Cervelo and some of the things that I hope you can learn from our mistakes uh, of which there were a hell of a lot. So um, I think that was one thing that uh, uh, Anna wrote about in the book. So Kelly's done a, you know, put out a few of the books there. Um, that was a, an attempt actually to, to be a, a learning experience for, for people. And uh, hopefully you'll find that um, it, well, it's an award-winning book. I think it's won six major awards now. Um, Good thing she uh, did it last year. The, the same category, the person that won against uh, her in her same category this year was like Barack Obama. So uh, she's had some uh, pretty good um, competition, but uh, lucky she started, I think, last year. I don't think it'd be Barack Obama this year. Anyways, the idea was to, uh, to learn from uh, some of the things we did, and hopefully people can uh, benefit from that. Um, what I'm going to do today is kind of focus on some of the things on aero. So it's a bit of a history thing and also get into what I see as some of the challenges from an aero standpoint and moving forward and some of the things that I, I think we can do. So uh, anyways, if you've, uh, we've got, uh, I think I've got half an hour here and, uh, and then we've got time for questions and I think your questions will probably be more relevant than the content so, uh, of my slide deck. So we'll leave plenty of time for that. I'm going to skip the video because these things don't work very well over Zoom. So uh, with with uh, broad with uh, bandwidth requirements, but anyways, and uh, as was mentioned before, now I'm working as the interim president of Four Eyes. So we make the most accurate and uh, robust power meters out there. Um, we're currently sponsoring ISN and several triathletes, um, but uh, that's the current gig. So our anyways, let's skip that. Uh, Gerard and I. Um, Founded the company in 95, 96. Um, the opinions are my own means because I used to put this together for uh, when I was actually presenting it for people that when I was still at Pawn. So uh, sometimes they conflicted. Uh, Gerard was actually a grad of uh, Technical University in Eindhoven. Uh, we met at McGill. Uh, my background was in project management and engineering from an aerospace standpoint. So uh, naval engineering and uh, satellites. Um, and the company was acquired by Pond Holdings in 2012. That was uh, Jordan and I when we were building our first bike, um, which was that, the uh, Baraki, um, which we nearly killed ourselves in as we were uh, kind of fell asleep in our apartment with the, uh, the oven running with the uh, vacuum pump, and the vacuum pump started pumping all the, uh, all the fumes into the room, and we kind of woke up and <laughs> could barely breathe. I managed to get a few windows open before we uh, suffocated. Um, it's a, uh, we went and looked initially for uh, customers that would, or not customers, but a partner. Uh, it wasn't designed as a, as a product that we were going to sell. It was designed, Hey, we could actually uh, partner with someone um, to actually make it and uh, use it on a protein. That was kind of the ultimate when you're uh, in high school or in university and kind of looking for something fun to do. Like, how cool would it be to have a bike ridden by, um, you know, a world champion? That's what it was designed for. And when we showed it to their uh, sponsor, <clears throat> they were entirely unimpressed. They said, no, 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 you don't, guys don't get it. You know, we make these round tube steel road bikes, 
and they're going to ride these round tube steel road bikes. Um, I guess lucky for us, we came home and realized that uh, a good friend of mine from university was actually a top uh, Canadian pro uh, triathlete. And he said, oh, this is brilliant. I'd love to uh, ride something that made me faster. And that's where we realized that the whole thing about making people faster was really what we were all about. It was two engineers that loved making people faster. And the one lesson here is, um, you know, we were just, we just caught on the triathlon as it was happening. And, um, you know, the biggest, uh, differentiator, the biggest key for success is absolutely timing. I mean, if you talk to venture capital people and they, and you say, what's the biggest thing that, that, uh, you know, that you're looking for. And that's a key success factor. They'll always mention the team, you know, the team and a, and a unique, uh, differentiated product. But the thing that always is the thing that key drives it more than anything else is timing. The timing is right for Cervelo. Aerodynamics and the triathlon community were just starting. And really, road cycling was not a big, uh, a big market for us. We always, people would ask us, what's your split between road and tri? And we'd always say, well, look at, the, uh, look at our model line. We've got uh, two road bikes and two tri bikes. It's 50-50. The reality was we sold about 85-15 triathlon to road for the first, I don't know, eight, 10 years. Um, triathlons were the triathletes were the ones that really, um, got what we were trying to do and embraced it. Road cycling didn't really take off until we had team CSC. And even then it was a very controversial. A lot of roadies went, Ooh, that thing's ugly. I'm not riding that even on the team. We'll get into that a little later. Um, so yeah, history here. Uh, we started in 1995 you know, we were doing work for, um, uh, uh, what's his name now? It was incredibly uh, embarrassing. Um, double world champion, um, worked on the MG Techno Gym, rode for MG Techno Gym. Jenny Buño, there we go. Um, and that was how we got started, was uh, Gerard actually uh, wrote a letter to Jenny Buño and not being friends with him, he uh, put in the envelope, because this is back in the snail mail days, Jenny Buño, Italy, and stuck it in the mailbox. And actually it got to him. And, uh, and that's how we got started with uh, his team and with him. And that original bike that we built, the Baraki, was designed for him. So it was designed, wasn't adjustable, it was designed for his, his uh, position. Uh, of course, that, back then, uh, Campagnolo was the big thing. Um, most of the tubes were Italian steel. Um, pretty much dominated by Columbus. Uh, Asia was really low end. Triathlon was just starting. Uh, that's Mark Allen. Um, but there was no re retail base. There was one triathlon shop when we started out. So, and the very little science, um, uh, you know, backing up, the very little science was used in, um, in improving performance. Uh, so huge change, I think, that we helped drive on that. Uh, era was almost non-existent, uh, but there were, you know, points where it was starting to become, uh, become popular or become used anyway, maybe not popular, but was becoming used. I think Le Mans did a huge, uh, influence on that by winning the tour, but it never caught on commercially. Um, hooker bikes out of Southern California were absolutely brilliant. Um, but didn't make, they couldn't sell, sell them. And actually when we started up, they were actually closing down because they just got fed up because they couldn't sell anything. I just threw this in because I think it's kind of funny. Uh, our story was like, because we weren't doing something fun and didn't fit into the model of, you know, the, the timing of what VCs were looking for, like bikes, especially in Canada. Like you make bikes and you make them in Canada. Like we couldn't get anyone to get a, give us a nickel. So we uh, self-financed. It was a bootstrap model. Um, we just continually ran out of money. That was the history of Cervelo in one word is we ran out of money constantly. Um, it kind of felt like this. I, I was in, when we started with CSC, I was over in uh, Africa for a training camp in South Africa. And we were out on a tour one day and, and this is a dung beetle. And so what it does is it finds a, a, a ball of poo from leftover from whatever animal out there and it collects it and it uh, lays its egg in, in this. So it's young to have something to uh, protect it area with something to eat. Um, to me, this was kind of like, uh, this, the, uh, 
a total metaphor for for what I felt at Cervello. It was, it was just like it was like a rolling a ball of shit uphill every day. It was just we were always out of money. It was a it was a rough haul. So I kind of kind of laughed when I saw this dung beetle. Anyways, but we definitely focused on niches. Um, we focused on that triathlon niche and aero, and um, you know we did everything from a from a data driven solution. We were always looking to make riders faster. That was our original mission. That's how Anna came up with the the, the name for the book. Uh, it was all about making riders faster. And there's always opportunities. So when the UCI in 2000 launched uh, their, their next generation of rules, everyone else just threw their hands up and went, oh, we can't possibly live in these rules. These are way too restrictive. And we looked at them from, uh, you know, really tried to pour over them line by line how do we beat these rules or how do we work within these rules to make a better bike? So everyone else left the field in 2000 and we were actually able to make a faster bike uh, under the rules. And that was really the, uh, the original P3 aluminum. So it was how to bend the rules. Um, and then Canadian cycling basically had to go to the UCI and, and show that we were an active, actively supporting athletes to try and get them to buy off on it because clearly they weren't, uh, they didn't really like our design. It was a little too rad. It was too radical for them, but they did uh, support it. And they wrote us a, a letter that athletes had to go to the commissaires to show them the letter that it was approved by the UCI because commissaires in those days would just approve things or not depending on their mood. Our big break was, uh, was Reese in 2003. Darren Reese had won the tour um, and he wanted to build his own team. And he wanted to pick every piece of equipment uh, that, that was the fastest piece of equipment for his riders. And that's how we got that, that well, we started out chatting with him on time trial bikes and we realized that we thought the same way. We were, all, we were looking for faster equipment uh, all the way through so we could make a faster regular road race bike. And that's Reese with our first road race bike, um, uh, which was a soloist. And we also, he said, part of the deal was, well, you got to have a super light climbing bike. And we said, yep, we're working on that. And, but the lesson here is you work with those that believe what you believe. And I'm not coming up with a nice uh, quotable line there. That's actually taken from Simon Sinek. Um, but the thing was, it's like, it, it works way better when you guys communicate with each other telepathically. Gerard and I did that. And we did that with Reese. Reese got it. He understood what we were trying to do. And uh, we ended up working with him collaboratively, super great uh, collaboration through till 2009. Um, but, you know, his riders were completely against it. It's like they said, oh, that thing is ugly. I'm never riding that. And Reese was pretty blunt. He said, I pay your salary, you ride that, or you're off the team. And uh, there were some expletives in some of those uh, things. But, you know, they didn't start out winning either. And the funny thing was, is that what started making that bike beautiful was when Tyler Hamilton won the tour or not the tour, but won Liege best only Liège. So, um, that was the big, uh, the big step forward for the team. And suddenly that ugly bike was a winning bike and there's nothing that makes uh, a bike beautiful than winning races. So, you know, this, you guys get this. I don't have to go into this, but I used to use this as, you know, why we bothered with Arrow. Well, because Arrow is, it's, you know, 75 to 85% of your resistance. And, you know, the other thing is, it's always on. I mean, this is, we had to come up with things that we could translate to people and make them understand what we were doing. I think this is the big challenge that we've always had in aerodynamics and we continue to have now. Um, so people still look at it as a marketing thing. It's not a marketing thing. It's the one thing you can do that actually makes a difference all the time. And when you're going uphill, it still has an effect. Yeah. Okay. When you get over five to 8%, um, you want a lighter weight bike if you've got a mountaintop finish, but the arrow is helping you whether you're going uphill, downhill, or on the, on the flats, we had to continually reinforce that. And I think the communication aspect is one of the key things where we have to work on, as a group of engineers and visionaries on the aero side. I'll talk more about that later. We did a bunch of wind tunnel work because this was the era where wind tunnels were becoming uh, accessible and CFD was not yet 
uh, working to that level. Um, but we spent a lot of time in the low speed wind tunnel in San Diego. Um, you can see here the, we made that machine that rider. It's actually Dave Zabriskie was scanned and we machined him out of foam and put him on a bike that had a, a steel backbone and we could replace all the pieces on that with uh, 3d printed, uh, parts to basically change out the shape of the bike and, and develop the bike. So that was our development tool was the wind tunnel, um, with all these 3d printed parts. So that was how we started. We soon, uh, uh, we soon grew into doing CFD as soon as we found that we could actually, um, it was, became approachable and affordable. Um, this is uh, one of our very early simulations, and I have a movie of it, but uh, I'm not going to play it because it's uh, the bandwidth issues. But CFD obviously continues to be um, the, big, the big tool now uh, that you can ex exercise as long, or along with the Aero Lab and, and that sort of uh, tool as well. Like, Riding on the, on the, in the wind tunnel, or, or sorry, in the wind tunnel is one thing. Outside is a completely different story. You just heard Carrie's uh, story of, you know, testing on uh, the velodrome versus outside. Yeah, I've, I concur with that. But CFD is a big part of it. Um, I think it's a very complementary tool to what you can do with, um, with you know, physical testing. So um, one of the things I was looking at several years ago before getting involved with uh, Four Eyes was, could we scan a rider and um, morph his position, uh, you know, all completely done in the computer to simulate um, the flow over him and get a drag position without having to go into the uh, complete physical testing? I do believe in the same way that, that uh, is done in Formula One, you do a lot of a, a lot of different simulations in CFD, and you pick out the best few, and then you do the physical testing on it. But now the way the cost of, of uh, testing has come way down in CFD, we can do a lot of this very cheaply. So actually, the reason I stopped doing this project was because I found Andrew Buckroll was actually already way ahead of me, uh, and then we actually ended up joining uh, together at uh, at Four Eyes. But they've got this virtual wind tunnel uh, model that he started when he was still at stack zero. And um, basically it allows you to morph the rider's position digitally and uh, run the CFD on it um, in, in, the, in the, well, run the CFD on it. You're driving down the cost to be in the order of a hundred to four hundred dollars per rider, um, unless you want more detailed consulting associated with optimizing the position for, um, for that rider but then you're probably looking at it, you're probably better at that point to go to uh, physical testing using an aero lab. But I think this is a complementary tool in the early phases of getting people um, in the better position. Much more so for the general use, for the pro teams, you're gonna end up going to the next level of, uh, of physical testing. But for your average rider, being able to plunk down 100 to $400 instead of you know, $3,000 to go to a wind tunnel, um, I think that's what it's really it's aimed at. Um, and I don't have the video showing the morphing, so we'll skip that. At Cervelo, we also did a, a lot of work in materials innovation and, uh, and trying to do digital simulation of the development of the frame as well. So uh, I won't go into that. That's not really what uh, we're here for today, but that was it. One of the questions we were asked uh, a few years ago is, are you guys designers or engineers? You know, we, we weren't famous racers. Um, and really what we did is we watched and we listened and we asked a lot of questions. We always tried to be the dumbest guys in the room. We always tried to surround ourselves with people that were way smarter than us and to ask a lot of questions so we really understood what the customer was doing. And we tried to get a lot. We surrounded ourselves with brilliant people. Um, and we looked for ideas from everywhere. As I went and looked at how do we translate innovation to, um, to the other brands within Pawn and to other, you know, I, I, I uh, do some consulting and teaching on this and stimulus, where do you get your ideas? Um, I think this is very relevant for us as engineers and designers. It's like, okay, the obvious one is you get things from, uh, from your customers. Ask your customers what they, what they want. They're not going to always have the answer. Your job is to anticipate their needs long before they can even articulate them. But they should ask them. 
and look at what your competition is doing. And then look at what's happening out there in the patent space, because old patents are also good stimulus for what, um, you know, how to do things. When we started doing internal cabling, we combined the ideas, some ideas we had with some 1930s patents on how to do it. So patents may not be the answer, but they'll stimulate ideas on how to go farther. And then wisdom. Yeah, you go to people that are uh, experts in the area, you go to a, a university prof, and he's happy to chat with you because no one ever talks to university profs. They kind of sit in their bubble and uh, they're happy to tell you everything they're doing, usually for free. And then futurologists. I love uh, uh, following some of the people in transportation. So where are we going now? Where is where it's happening? I love following the work that's being done by uh, the futurist at Ford and GM. I can't remember their names, but if you uh, Google them, you'll, you'll pull that up. And also uh, Mary Meeker in, uh, in tech. So um, some ideas there on where to get ideas from. I, I always like doing this because I, I like talking about design. I'm a, I'm, I'm a design guy. Uh, I think this is the one thing that separates those of us on this call from probably everyone else out there in the industry is we have a function driven approach to design as opposed to a fashion driven approach. I mean, people were very shocked that we, we did all of our design. We didn't tell engineers uh, what they want, what we wanted as far as a look. We told them what we wanted as far as a performance. And after they'd finished the design, then we would sit back and go, okay, so how do we clean this up from a design standpoint? Because sometimes the answers we got from the engineer were just downright ugly. Uh, I remember when we kind of, kind of came out with the square tube that we called Squaro. Um, and, and we looked at that and went, holy crap, that is ugly. How the hell are we ever going to sell that? But it was authentic. It design came out of the engineering. We, and so it was like, okay, you know, I think we have to trust our customers. They, our under, customers understand us. Remember, we weren't asking after everybody. We were after people that thought like us. That's who we spoke to. So we weren't, after, we weren't trying to get the, the 80% of the market. We were trying to find maybe the 15% of the market that believe the same things we do, the early innovators and early adopters. And so we said, we're going to flow it out there and, and see if they understand it. And they did. So even this radically new weird shaped bike, they got it. And, you know, it was easy. And the, and the design for us was very easy. It was very functionally driven. All we do is clean up a few things that we could do without affecting the performance, which is how we ended up with the, our designs. And ghosted in the background, I think, is the guy that Jordan and I felt were always uh, probably the greatest uh, in influence on this design, and that was Dieter Rams. Um, if you look at his design for a radio in 1958 versus the first generation iPod that came out of Johnny Ive, um, absolutely, totally, uh, really driven by uh, the same style. So uh, Dieter Rams, huge influence on, on us. The other thing is just simplicity. Um, and so I've ghosted in the background uh, a, Coco, a Chanel bag, and uh, she was the first one that said simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. But we were very, very simple in our designs. And, you know, one of the things that I found was that you know, our design was not, our design took people where they didn't know they want to go. And I'm going to contrast that with Chris Bangle, the BMW designer that said, um, our job is to take people where they don't want to go. No. Our job is to take people where they didn't know they wanted to go. And I think that's a big difference. We weren't trying to make something weird and different for the sake of being different. We were trying to lead people in a new direction that was better and it was driven by that functional design. So I hope this is interesting for you guys. I mean, you guys are more on the engineering side, I think, in this, on this call. But to me, the, the blend between engineering and design is very important. And you're probably really designers. You're probably not really engineers because you're looking at changing people's behavior. Uh, and that's a big part of design. And you're not doing it in a focus group. You're doing it because of your vision. Anyways, I'm going to skip off on this. Um, so I think some of the biggest uh, design influences that Gerard and I had were Mies van der Rohe, uh, especially in the architectural side. Um, Chanel with that uh, minimalism, Ferry Porsche on the functional design, and Dieter Rams, of course. That was our first, I think, our big breakthrough when we had uh, Carbon, was the 
it was the carbon P3, um, carrying forward the design language of the curved seat tube, uh, which we uh, begun in the aluminum era. Um, and that did become kind of the defining look for tri bikes, but it came out of a functionally driven design process. It was covering more of the rear wheel um, and, and fairing it in. And that's why we ended up with that. So it was a functionally driven design um, that gave it a very different and unique language that was good for us. So we had a patent on that. We never enforced it. Uh, we couldn't afford to. But the thing was, people started talking about, oh, do you have that Cervelo look with that kinked seat tube? And it's like, it was way better not to have it uh, patented or to not to have it enforced because everyone kept talking about the Cervelo look with the kink seat tube. So from a branding thing, we had everyone talking about our unique look. Um, we had some pretty good luck uh, with, uh, I guess we had 70 plus pro Ironman wins, three in Kona, two with Chrissy Wellington and one with uh, Frederick Van Liard um, in 2013. And that was uh, our uh, history with uh, moving to the Kona bike count and how we came to dominate that in the, in the early part of the, uh, the 2000s. Again, just to, to reinforce that the switch for us in 2004, 2005 was not our brilliant marketing and, you know, brilliance as a, as a company. It was a total shift in the, t it was a result of great timing. The shift happened uh, in 2000, like before that it was dominated by Trek. The, the, the Kona bike count was dominated by the Trek OCLV. And what happened in 2004 and five was people started to listen to Dan Emfield and triathletes and started to say, what you want is a steep seat angle tri bike. So you wanted to roll the, the rider position forward so that they were on a 76 or 78 degree or more, it became 79, 80 degree seat tubes and pivot forward. So you kept, kept your hip angle the same. And that, was what triathletes, that was the innovation that triathlon needed and it completely pivoted people towards triathlon bikes and where we were just best positioned to take advantage of that because we had done a bunch of data, we'd done a bunch of testing and we proved if we can pivot people forward and keep their hip angle the same, there was no drop in power. And that was the stuff we did before we started the company. So we were just well positioned to take advantage of that. So I can't say it was anything brilliant on our side. Um, these are two of my favorite, uh, things. We, we won about 22 Olympic medals. This is one with, uh, Kristen Armstrong and that's Mick Rogers, who now works for the UCI, um, as their technical liaison. Um, ah, we'll skip the rest of the, the, uh, we won a bunch of classics. We were on, uh, the podium six years out of seven at Perrier Bay. I think we run 25 or so world championships. That's Carlos Sastra winning the tour in 2008. And this, you know, sorry, I had to put this one in as a Canadian. I'm super proud of this. Um, that, of course, is Ryder Hedgedahl in 2012, um, winning the Giro d'Italia. And he's on the podium there with a hockey stick and a, and a flag. So as a Canadian, I'm, I'm super proud of that, um, that a Canadian won the Giro on a Canadian bike. And that was the first time ever. So uh, impressive. Thank you. So oh, there we go. 2012, we uh, pulled the uh, ejection seat and uh, we were out, um, out of the company in, uh, in 2012. We stayed on as uh, consultants and, um, and advisors for the following five years where I, I kept going as the uh, innovation, uh, chief innovation officer at, at the Pond Bike Group for the next five years and then left. Um, oh, sorry, one thing was... Uh, Okay, so now we're talking about things that I think are probably relevant for us. The biggest the influence on the performance is the rider's head. I didn't realize this. You know, we were all about uh, making better bikes and doing the engineering. And it wasn't until we had our test team in 2009 uh, that we realized just how important the rider's head was. So we hired for values. We hired for people that believed what we believed. Um, and that's how we had it. It was very focused on doing it clean and doing it with the, the best equipment. So they had to believe they had the best equipment and they did. Um, and they just went out and won. Like if you look at the, the, the riders we had on that test team, you know, we had Carlos, we had Thor, 
but the rest of the writers weren't phenomenal names that had a, a fantastic uh, Palmar's, but they believed they were winners. They believed they had the best equipment and they believed they could win because they had the best equipment. And they just went out and won. And it was the world's number one team within six months. So we came from nothing, from a completely new team to being the world's number one ranked team uh, on June 1st. And we didn't have the same strength in, um, in the Grand Tours, uh, but we did do very, very well in the Classics, the early season Classics, and in the Giro uh, that year. So the riders had, I never believed how strong that was. There's a great uh, uh, short little uh, video I saw one time where they, they had, boxer, had a boxer, and they, they were measuring the force of his punch. And they said, okay, we're going to measure the force of your punch. And they said, wind up, think about it, wind up as hard as you can and punch this, this dummy. And they measured the force of the punch. And they said, okay, now we're going to use, we're going to use doping. We're going to see just how strong we can, much stronger we can make you with the best doping available. And they repeated the thing and he was significantly stronger. Um, and it was, so it was like, yeah, the doping works. And then they went back to his coach and they said, okay, doping is gone you got to psych him up. How, how strong can you make him when you work only with his head, when you make him believe that he's super strong? And that trumped um, the doping completely. The rider's head, was, or, or the, the boxer's head in this case, was the thing that was the biggest influence on their performance. So what's our role then as engineers if it's not actually designed the best equipment? It is to design the best equipment, and it is to test but it is to make them believe they have the best equipment and that they're the fastest and that they're unbeatable. So yeah, I was, I didn't realize how much of an influence it was until we had the test team and we saw it. It was like, couldn't believe the results. Um, this is one of my favorites was, uh, Heinrich Hausler, a uh, total guy that, uh, was underrated and had some phenomenal results on us. And it was all in his head. It was the, the breakthrough for Heinrich Hausler was believing he could do it and having a coach that believed in him. So this is the next thing is, uh, is where I think that the challenge for us as aero, uh, aero visionaries, um, what we saw is that we had this, we were really, we were pretty good at getting the innovators and the early adopters. This is the Rogers uh, innovation adoption curve which you probably know, is, is came out in, uh, in the early 60s, actually. The adoption curve is generic. It's driven around uh, any, any innovation. Um, the, the innovation that he actually did, the, did his doctorate on and actually developed it was the adoption of hybrid corn species in the U.S. Uh, by farmers. Just trivia you didn't really probably know, but probably didn't need to know, but it's interesting. Um, so it was the 1960s, early 70s, uh, a lot of work done on, on this adoption. Um, but there's this chasm, and it's been well documented, this chasm between early adopters and the early, and the early uh, majority. And that's what we found was a big problem for us. We actually looked at it a little bit differently um, at Cervelo. We looked at it as a, a bullseye, as a target. And we said... You know, those early adopters, those are the hardcore athletes. That's the guys in the yellow, right in the, right in the center there. They totally got what we were doing. They were looking for um, the, the technology that could do it. They were the technologists. And then the next ring out was really those visionaries. So that's the red ring. Um, they got it. There was no problem. The problem was jumping to the pragmatists. So they were saying, okay, what's in it for me? You know, this is, this is the question is, how do you get those people? How do you, how do you deal with those 84% of people that are after the first two rings? Um, because they're looking for solutions and convenience. And, and we needed a social solution for them. It wasn't the data was not going to solve them. And so a lot of people were riding bikes and they were going, that's, that's interesting, but it's irrelevant for me. Because they, were, they couldn't see how error was relevant. They go, yeah, yeah, but I'm not riding the Tour de France. I'm not doing a time trial where, with, against the best in the world. I'm going out riding with my buddies. It's not relevant for me. And the, really, the challenge for us was how do we, how do we deal with that, that attitude? And what we found that had the best result was, you know what's relevant for you? Is not getting dropped. Is comfort. Comfort 
is the big thing that you, if you're going out riding with your buddies or your guys, you know, the hammer always goes down at some point. It's the sprint for the town line. And, and what's, what's important for you? Yeah. Well, actually getting to the town line first. So you got bragging rights. That's part of it. But the other thing was not getting dropped. So comfort and not getting dropped. And we can give you up to 30 watts in aerodynamics. So if we can give you that, you're not going to get dropped. You're not riding home alone. So that's what made aerodynamics relevant for the next group, for the early majority. So how do we get, and this is, I think, is still a problem for aerodynamics today, is how do we make it relevant for the early majority? How do we cross the chasm? So, I mean, there's been a lot of, uh, I think the interesting work on this is actually uh, work done on um, the Gartner, uh, Gartner Consulting Group has done this hype cycle related to, okay, how does this, you go from the, instead of calling it the, the, uh, the chasm, they call it the trough of disillusion, but it happens more or less at the same time. So, you know, it's not irrelevant for me. The inflated expectations going to the trough of disillusion, but we've got to cross that trough for it to become mainstream. And I think that's one of the challenges. So if you're interested in this, um, uh, Moore's book in 2014 on crossing the chasm is interesting. And there's Maloney's 18% or 16% rule which says that you've got to stop talking about being first and the technology, and you've got to start talking about the social, providing social proof and um, using influencers as you move uh, to the early majority. So it's a completely different change in how you're talking about your product if you move from the innovators and early adopters to crossing the chasm and getting to the early majority. And I think that's a challenge that we have uh, in, in general, but certainly in aerodynamics. And this is, I just showed it up here as a, this is hype uh, technology. This is Gartner's thing on looking at emerging technologies and where they are on the hype cycle. I'll let you follow that up on your own. It's, it's quite interesting, but Gartner.com and hype cycles, they have it broken down by different industries as well. So, um, but that's how they, they view the current evolution of emerging technologies on the hype cycle. And this is another the other point. The, rel the data is not here is, is not relevant at all. What's look what you look at this is this is how we tend to present data. This is wind tunnel data, but um, as as engineers and designers, this is how we tend to present things. So, you know, we're talking to a, we're trying to expand the people we're talking to, and we've got this graph of beta across the bottom in degs. What is that? Uh, and then we've got this drag in grams. On, on the, the vertical, the y-axis. So you're showing a guy that's saying, how is this gonna help my ride better? How much better is my ride with a gram better at negative five delta beta? It's like, how is this relevant to me? Um, how is this tailored to my goals? Is this meaningful? And the answer is, it's completely not meaningful. We present this data in a manner that's completely not meaningful or contextual for our customer. If we want our customer to relate to this, drag in grams uh, across a beta is not relevant. And we have to find a better way of making it relevant and tailored to the goals of those cyclists. So that's the real, uh, I'm trying to get across as the takeaway. The data is not relevant here. Everyone here is looking at this and going, what is this? What are these things here? It's not relevant. Uh, the point here is I'm trying to get across is we have to start talking about things in terms that are relevant for our customer. And maybe I'm kind of pushing this beyond the pro tour teams and you guys, but I mean, think about this. How do you make this also relevant for your customer? Cause a lot of, a lot of uh, even riders won't understand this curve. They'll look at it and they'll try to, but a lot of them are not going to understand it. And it's our job to translate this and communicate it in terms that people get. So that's it for me. Um, I hope that was relevant for you guys. And, uh, and valuable. Um, I'm totally open to questions. Awesome. Thank you, Phil. That, uh, that was fantastic. You know, for me, you presented a lot of stuff there and a lot, there was a lot of great successes, you know, along the way with the, with the wins, the tour de France, the, the classics you mentioned, you mentioned many of them. I'm sure there was lots of little tipping points sort of along the way there, be it on the high performance side, on their business side, but the, and I'm glad you put this slide up to me, the, the most, 
a proving point about the sustainability and su- the success you've had or Cervelo had as a business and brand was that consistent success. And you still have it in that Kona bike count. I know it gets a lot of hype. It's just a snapshot on the, the number of bikes that are on the pier on that particular day, but you've been winning that for, for 15 years and, and massively. So, um, you know, how, how important, you know, was the Kona bike count in terms of business discussions you had behind the scenes in the context of what I just put it in? Well, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, the problem is as a, as a company is trying to get um, objective data that validates your, uh, your business decisions. Um, so, you know, you're looking at uh, how do you, how do you make, um, how do you switch something from, the define and discover phase of, of innovation uh, because that's relatively low cost uh, to go through that and, and come up with ideas and kind of prototype them. The big jump in the cost goes when you pull it into full scale development. And so the question is, where do you get data that validates that you're on the right track? Um, it, it's, it's easier now in, in the, in the digital age. Uh, and as we can do cheap prototypes, um, so we can, we can do that better. But that was always one thing for us uh, is, are we being adopted? Is our message getting out there to our core customer, which was really, you know, uh, road cyclists and triathlon, uh, triathletes. And, um, you know, we, we focused a lot on triathlon. We really, really liked uh, that customer. We really engaged with them. So that was a huge, uh, huge thing was actually seeing that, uh, that, that data show up. Um, that's still nice. I mean, we used to go and do bike counts at, at Grand Fondos um, that, to measure our penetration in different regions and also in the, in that market who are actually buying bikes, um, as, you know, for, for road use as opposed to, uh, you know, pro tour teams. And we changed that um, as a, as a, in a working session with our engineers and, and, or with our, with our employees. And we drove values out of it and we had values. But the thing that always resonated with people and what they would always come back to is they would always talk about what's our job. What's our job here? Our job is to make riders faster. So the engineers, even when we told them that wasn't the mission statement anymore, and even after Jordan, I left, they would still talk about that. And so there was a pushback in some, uh, in some new direction after Jordan, I left from people internally because they so internalized what they were doing there that they wouldn't let the company change uh, what it was doing. So, you know, you talk about what's important in a company. Um, well, clearly having the foundation of, you know, knowing why you exist, knowing your culture, uh, that's super important. Uh, and we drove that in and that key values, which was for us making riders faster. Awesome. And indeed they were, they won a lot of races. Uh, and, and that was fantastic. We're going to run, uh, we're going to run a little bit over time here. We're going to, I think we're going to go probably to the top of the hour and then we'll take a 15 minute, uh, coffee break before the final presentation, uh, and session of the day. Cause there are some great questions for Phil out there coming in from the attendees. Thank you for that. Uh, Paulo Saldana, Phil, uh, says to say hello. Uh, if you don't know who Paulo Saldana is, he is, uh, Mike Woods, professional writer, Mike Woods, personal coach and the performance director at the Israel startup uh, nation team question from uh, Paulo uh, Phil, when do you think the virtual wind tunnel uh, will be released out of beta and into the market? It could be an interesting and validating static tool to use in combination with aero lab equipment for optimizing aero positions. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, uh, Paulo, I think that the two together are, are a very powerful tool um, so I think, you know, right now, uh, we're still doing, uh, beta testing. So if you guys are, are interested in, in test, in testing that out, uh, the cost is relatively low until you want to get into running multiple iterations of it. Uh, we can digitally manipulate that rider and put them in and get them to the point of understanding, um, you know, this position is, you know, better than that one. And maybe you want to optimize it using AeroLab focusing on this position, like, if you, if you know that you're the praying mantis is faster than a traditional aero position, spend your time optimizing it using AeroLab in the praying mantis position. Don't waste your time with those other things. We can narrow that down with, uh, with the uh, virtual wind tunnel. It's ready. So, you know, we, we haven't launched it, but it is available for you guys. If you guys are, any of you are interested, um, you know, if you go to, uh, 
I go to stackzero.com and you can click on, um, you know, get more information there or go to, you can just email me, philw at uh, foureyes.com and I'll put you over with Andrew who is, uh, actually Andrew is a funny story. It's all a small world. Uh, Chris is an old colleague of Andrew's from uh, back at U of W. So these guys know each other. They've discussed the technologies and back and forth. Um, but anyways, yeah, you can email me and I'll put you forward onto Andrew, who is the guy that originally developed that. Um, it'll probably be released uh, in, in wider uh, distribution in the first half of next year, calendar year. And I think um, if we can... And we seem to be having some very difficult technologically, oh. but there's a lot of tech that goes into it. I think it'll be another year till we get it ready for mainstream, but can do it now if you're interested. There we go. Making connections uh, on the symposium. There you go, Paulo. Thank you very uh, much for that. And best wishes, Paulo, to the Israel Startup uh, Nation team uh, going into next year. Lots of Canadian connections, including yourself uh, uh, with that team and the team owner. So uh, we'll a little, uh, Maple Leaf flag uh, cheering along for Israel Startup Nation as they get going on the world tour uh, next year. Next question to Yago Alconde. Uh, Yago is asking about bike fits, Phil. This is on uh, road bikes. I've been doing bike fits for 10 years now, and I see the necessity for a change in seat tube angle on road bikes. I think we need to go from 73 to 75 or 76 degrees. Uh, I'm guessing to fit sort of certain people into the parameters. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Yago, for the question. Well, Yago, I think the answer is you probably know better than I do. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as we learn more, um, we definitely should be uh, adjusting it. Like we, uh, in the early days of our correlation or of our work with CSC, we changed our seat tube slightly. Um, you know, you've got a fair bit of range on the rails, um, but we, we were actually running um, 73 and a half degrees. We actually slacked it out to 73. Um, and we found though that uh, we were running, you know, with, with the aero bikes, especially we were having a wide range of adjustability. Uh, on the seat post. So that was how we accommodated that. I haven't really looked at it in detail over the last, you know, really since I left. So, you know, what's that? Well, eight, uh, 2012. So quite a few years since I've uh, looked at in detail at a road bike and what the trends are in geometry. I think certainly on a TT bike or a track bike, yeah, you need to go steeper. Um, you know, we, Code 78 was really 80 where people were really running in reality on T on TT and, and triathlon bikes. And really they've, they've morphed together now. Um, especially ri as riders have kind of you know, got new saddles and uh, been able to push their ride, their saddles farther forward and still fit within the UCI boxes. Um, and as, as of the positions have changed there. So I think you guys are the fitters. You guys are the ones we would, we would engage with you for your advice. So um, that's where the feedback is super valuable. Like anyone that's doing, uh, you know, any work on bike design is looking for your guys' input. And that's why, you know, Guru, when they sold off their uh, fitting system to um, Cannondale, I went, oh, that's brilliant. Like Cannondale now knows how every bike that's fitted on that, they've got a huge database. That's, that's super valuable. I mean, I thought that was a brilliant strategic move from Cannondale's side. Well, they, they, they made the purchase not so much for the Guru Fit system, but the data that was sort of embedded, you know, in there of those thousands and thousands of fits that uh, yeah. uh, Guru and the custom bikes that Guru would have made over the course of time is, is what you're saying. Yeah, and specialize as well with uh, their purchase uh, of their fitting system. I mean, I don't think they really care about the fitting system. I think they care about the data. Certainly that's what would, I would be find traditional, very uh, interesting if I was running a bike company. Sure. Um, next question, uh, Phil, from John uh, Bennett. Uh, John's asking about uh, the UCI uh, rules and regulations and when there might be a relaxing, you know, of those, if, uh, if any. And you and I just crossed over on that because we saw uh, triathlete Lionel Sanders come off, you know, riding on a traditional triathlon bike, probably with a steeper angle, had to fit himself on a track bike, 
uh, conformed to those UCI regs uh, and ran on the track, and he did very well. He broke the Canadian record and went 51.3 uh, kilometers in, in a one-hour ride. So maybe speak to those uh, UCI regulations. I know you, both you and Gerard have had uh, uh, various thoughts on those over the course of time. You know, it's funny. I mean, the rules are the rules. you got to work within them, and I understand where the UCI is coming from. Obviously, as uh, someone who's uh, dedicated to making riders faster, I'm looking at pushing the rules uh, as required to make riders faster. I don't want to. I don't want to live within the rules. Um, but uh, yeah, there is that gray zone uh, as well. Um, so yeah, I don't know what I can tell you. I mean, certainly they've they've relaxed the rules recently on uh, on bike design and on the dimensions of tubes and how you have to fit the seat tube and that sort of thing. So there's a lot more uh, freedom now than there was, uh, you know, two or three years ago. Uh, are, are those relevant? Like I mean, basically what they've done is they've taken away the thickness requirement. So bikes are going to get thinner as people try to optimize it. Um, I'm not sure there's a lot to be gained there. I mean, certainly I've done some work on, on track bikes and yes, thinner is better but there's a limit to how thin you can make it from an engineering standpoint, from a getting adequate stiffness in there. I think what it's going to do is actually going to drive people to find better uh, solutions to making a bike uh, engineered from a structural standpoint, because if you want to make it narrower, you've got to solve the structural, uh, the structural issues and wrapping super high modulus material around a very, very tight trailing edge is they just crack. I mean, the material cracks as you bend it over. So you don't have the continuous layers. It looks continuous, but it's not. So um, I think that's the challenge. Um, so I, I think that's going to be where we're going to uh, see some improvements. Let's call for uh, questions uh, to the attendees before we wrap up uh, this time with Phil. We'll go back uh, to the floor for this one, though. Cosmos Devotion is asking a, a question about um, data making a comment actually in the new data world, early adopters seem to be more than 30%. Um, that's his comment. And the question is, when do you think we can have all the systems working together so we can solve a lot of demands off, uh, off of questions of the riders? I'm not sure I understand that completely. M maybe you do better than I do, Phil. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it may seem that, uh, that, you know, for, for our group of people, I mean, we speak to the innovators and early adopters. It might seem that they're that, that they're bigger, but I think that's just because we get, we get caught up in our own little uh, social media bubble and our social media bubble is not, you know, not one of the, is not the left or the right. Our social media bubble is the innovators and early adopters of aerodynamics. So I think that's a thing you got to step back and, and look for people that uh, don't get what we're talking about. And there's a lot of people out now that are that are not looking for the next aero bike. Um, but aero is relevant, as as Gerard is showing. Like even a gravel, you go gravel. What what what's aero about that? It's like aero is faster all the time. It's always there. It's always on. So uh, we just got to uh, we can't forget that everyone is our customer, um, but they're not talking to us maybe, or they're not listening to our to our message. Uh, but I do think it's uh, I don't. I mean, the numbers have been pretty well established over time. Um, and it's just a question of, uh, you know, are people getting it? I think there's, there's one area that, I, and I'm, I'm working on it, so I'm going to give a teaser out to some work I'm doing. Um, it's like people think we've got now to the, the plateau. Like, you know, there, there, there is nothing more we can do on Arrow. It's all been done. And that's absolutely not the case. Um, we're thinking very rigidly about how, you know, the shape and is it, you know, is it this nose shape or that, or that trailing edge shape and, you know, what should be the radius here? What should be the radius there? But we've forgotten to look at how nature actually works. If you look at the way a bird flies, if you look at, you know, the performance of an owl or the wing on a, on an eagle, it's a completely morphing shape. And at, at Cervello, we were trying to figure out how do we change the shape of the airfoil um, so that it can adapt to, um, adapt to reality, adapt to the wind conditions that it's seeing. And we never figured it out. Um, I'm working with someone now, and we think we've got to figure it figured out. Because if you look at a, a wing on a plane, you're, I mean, you guys haven't flown in eight months now, but 
I mean, back in the good old days when you could get a fl- on a plane and then you also look out the window and watch what's happening with that wing. And you see it. It goes from being basically flat like this to being curved like this as you're landing or taking off. Well, why does that work? Well, it generates more lift. It's like, why do we not want to have that ourselves? You look at all the, all the bikes and the wheels out there. They all stall at, you know, 15 degrees. Can you really improve that? Yeah. That's the challenge is how do we move so that, that things don't stall at 15 degrees or earlier? Cause really nothing goes beyond there. So yeah, there's still work to do. Um, it's not easy, but it can be done. So I think start thinking about that. How do we, we haven't reached, uh, you know, the arrow peak. Uh, we've, uh, we're on a plateau. There's another peak yet to come. That's interesting news, stuff in the pipeline uh, to come, Phil. So we'll uh, keep on the lookout and be on the lookout for that. Uh, on that same note, uh, might the UCI restrictions, and we've already we've talked a, a bit about them in terms of the line of questioning here, might they be restrictive? You know, is the, is the absolute most aerodynamic bike that's on the market right now uh, a UCI standard bike, or is it one of, you know, the Beam-style bikes like uh, the Cervella P5X, or there's a, a bunch of different manufacturers out there that do have sort of Beam sort of style bikes. Are those more purely aerodynamic, even though they are away from what the UCI regs are? You know, it's, it's odd. I haven't really seen a, a lot of people kind of used to be in the, in, you know, 15 years ago, everyone would, go to the wind tunnel and uh, there was enough wind tunnel data out there. And, and Cervelo, if, if you look back on the Cervelo data, I mean, it's out of date now, but we're pretty honest about that. Like, you know, it, it is very important that you understand uh, the setup and making it consistent. And that's why I think, oh, you know, the guys at AeroLab add a lot of value when they're coaching you individually about, you know, how to do a test. Um, a tool is only as good as knowing how to use it. So um, we'd spent a lot of time in the, in the tunnel and we'd worked at a very, very detailed and, and uh, very, yeah, very detailed protocol on how to test things. You know, even just leaving the shift lever up in a different position would give us different, different results. So you've got to take all those funny little things that you wouldn't normally think of into account. And the same thing with uh, running out in the real world with an AeroLab. Um, but, uh, sorry, I got, got lost my train of thought. It's like, yeah, the UCI is there. Yeah, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I don't know. You'd have to run it through and, and see it. I mean, I think one of the things that we learned, if you look at every Cirello bike after really the first Baraki there, one thing we did was we always fared in the rear wheel. And, uh, and that was the biggest influence on performance was fairing in the rear wheel. Maybe we shouldn't say fairing because that's a, a bad word in UCI in the UCI language, but protecting the rear wheel. So how would I, how would I make a P5X faster? I'd put a fender on it to protect the rear wheel. Um, so I think there's a, an opportunity to improve beam bikes. Uh, now the question is what about the upper seat tube above the wheel? And as it goes up to the, to the rider, yeah, there's, there's probably something, uh, there. And, uh, I've done some work on that, but not enough that I think that, you know, it's, it's in the details. It's, there's not a definitive statement that you can make that a beam bike, uh, the beam is faster than a, than a, than a regular seat tube. 